Thank you. And I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present uh, our work. Uh, I've been at the KITP for four weeks so far and uh, been very productive and I'm very grateful. Uh, I wrote two papers, uh, one of which was posted uh, yesterday, appeared last night in California. Uh, this work is uh, uh, about the, the other papers that to be to appear. And uh, my aspiration goal, aspirational goal for this work was to derive useful swampland conditions uh, from the first principle. And uh, so I'd like to explain what I mean by that. Uh, so, uh, so there have been many uh, swampland conditions or speculation being proposed. And uh, I think it's now time to roll up our sleeves and start proving or falsifying them. So that's one of my aspirations. And the other is to be useful. And uh, by use, so there, actually a few weeks ago, we had a discussion session at the KITP. And there, uh, I think we had a, a diverse group, a variety of group, uh, uh, theorists uh, came to uh, have a panelist. They all agreed that uh, there are some non-trivial constraints on low energy effective theory uh, uh, by consistency of uh, uh, unification of general relativity and quantum mechanics. But of course, people differ in the opinion of how useful such constraints are. So here I would like to define usefulness in the narrow sense that it gives you a sharp constraint on low energy effective Lagrangian. Now, whether such a constraint is useful for particle physics or cosmology is uh, the other question. But I think putting constraint on low energy effective Lagrangian is a prerequisite. Uh, to such work. So that's, what, that's my aspirational goal. So it, as I said, it has become increasingly clear, and I think we uh, all agree, that there are non-trivial constraints on low energy limits of quantum gravity that cannot be captured by the standard Wilsonian paradigm of low energy effective theory. And the swamp plan is the idea to delineate between uh, a, a landscape and swamp plan, that it, it determine the boundary between them. So uh, when we say uh, derive, of course, we need to understand the, the ultraviolet completion. And the ads -CFT is one of the places where we can actually hope to have derivation from the fundamental principle. And uh, so that's what I would like to do today. So in ADS, we can formulate and aim to prove or falsify such constraint in the language of CFT. And uh, so for example, uh, Daniel Haro and I, uh, like five years ago, uh, prove that uh, uh, that any global symmetry in quantum gravity theory in ADS would lead to an inconsistency in dual CFT. So this is sort of example of uh, deriving uh, a swamp land condition from the first principle. But unfortunately, we cannot say that this was a useful constraint because, uh, for example, the global, seeming, uh, global symmetry in low energy effective action can be accidental and it be, can be broken by arbitrary high order in uh, uh, the derivative expansion. So it doesn't give you a sharp constraint on low energy effective Lagrangian. So we want to be useful. So uh, the distance conjecture can potentially be useful. Because, uh, it was uh, proposed by me and Kumran uh, 18 years ago. And there, is, there are several conjectures. I listed three of them. The first conjecture says that every parameter in quantum gravity is an expectation value of dynamical field, and therefore can be varied by changing an expectation value. That's a zero order conjecture. And the first conjecture is that uh, there's always an infinite distance in the uh, moduli space. That is that if you choose any point in the moduli space in the bulk theory, then for any positive uh, real number t, you can find another point which is distance greater than t. And then th the second conjecture is uh, to make it quantitative which is to say that if you have such a distant point, then the mass decay, there is always a light particle with mass decaying at the exponential of e to the minus alpha t, or some alpha, okay? So, so this is a, these are a three conjectures. So ever since uh, we made this conjecture 18 years ago, uh, this has, I have been wanting to put some numerical constraints on alpha. Because in order for this conjecture to be useful, we need to have a lower bound on alpha, because otherwise uh, we can come up with low energy effective theory, which can avoid these conjectures, saying that where well, alpha can be much smaller than this, for example. So it'd be useful if we can put constraint on alpha. Okay, uh, now, so uh, another aspiration is to derive such constraint. And in that uh, department, uh, 
There is a, a very nice work by uh, uh, Eric Parmut, uh, Leonardo Rasseri, Cameron Buffer, and Irene Byrenzuela uh, some years, a few years ago, where they formulated this distance conjecture in the language of dual CFT, if you consider it in ADA CFT. So I listed two of uh, their conjectures. They had uh, three or four conjectures, but this is two of them. So one is that uh, by using the correspondence between moduli space of ADS gravity and conformal manifold of CFT, which is a moduli space of conformal field theory, they conjecture that uh, all points with high, higher spin symmetries are at the infinite distance, and all CFT at the infinite distance in moduli space have higher spin symmetry. Okay? So these are the two conjectures. The first conjecture was easier to prove, and in fact, uh, uh, in the original paper, they have already proven this for supersymmetric theories. And last summer, uh, Baum and Calderon Infante showed that uh, the conjecture one is true for any uh, uh, she, uh, uh, unitary CFT. So I heard this work at uh, 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 a swamp land meeting in uh, Madrid uh, last fall, and uh, I thought, well, this is something I should work on. So, so, so I'd like to present uh, the result of, uh, of this uh, investigation. Uh, I would like to point out uh, in their work, uh, so far there is no general constraint on alpha. So my aim was to put, find some constraint on alpha. And uh, so, uh, so we did that. Uh, I did that with EFAN1 uh, in the context of ADS3 and CFT2. So this is the work that I would like to present to you today. So this is a work in collaboration with Yifan Wang, and uh, I hope it will appear very shortly. So today, I would like to explain to you these three statements. And hopefully, uh, uh, this is, well, I cannot claim this as proof in the, at the rigor of mathematics, but I hope it will be at the level uh, agreeable to the theoretical physicist. So, uh, so there are three statements I would like to present. One is that if there is a geodesic on conformal manifold along which lowest positive conformal dimension, which may, you may call as a gap in conformal dimension above vacuum, decays monotonically and vanishes at some point, then the damological distance in, measured by this conformal field theory calculation to that limit is infinite. The second theorem is that in that limit, the conformal dimension vanishes exponentially like this. And uh, so this was what conjectured uh, with, by uh, Kumaran and me uh, 18 years ago. And But in this case, actually, we can prove that there is this exponential decay. And moreover, we can give an upper bound on this coefficient alpha. So this is, so, so I'm going to explain these two theorems first. And then, uh, in fact, moreover, we can identify the necessary and sufficient condition when this upper bound gets saturated. Now, how about the lower bound? Well, so, so, so there comes the theory, uh, theorem three, which is that uh, actually we can know more about conformal field theory in that limit, which is that in the CFT at the limit is actually a direct product of sigma model in the decompactification limit. Namely, you can imagine n-dimensional torus and the radius of the torus grows large and then become Rn, for example, times some compact conformal field theory. And from this description, it follows that alpha is lower bounded by one over square root of C, where C is the central charge of the original conformal field theory. So it gives you a lower bound. Okay, so there are lots of words on this transparency. So, so, so I actually I try to make this, let's see, where is my pointer? here. So, so there are lots of words here. So, so I try to make this more concise. So basically what I'm going to tell you is that this conformal dimension gap, gap above the vacuum, vanishes only at the infinite distance in conformal manifold. And there it decays exponentially in the of distance. And we can bound the, this coefficient alpha between one over square root of c and one. So this is what I would like to explain to you. We make two assumptions. One is that uh, we are assuming that this deformation is generated by exactly marginal operator. So uh, therefore, in particular, we assume that this deformation does not change the central charge. 
there is an interesting question of what happens when you consider sequence of conformal field theory, like minimum model, where central charge goes to some particular limit. And uh, so it's not under the purview of this theorem. There might be, we might be able to extend some of the statement in such a case, but uh, it, today I'm not going to talk about it. The other is that we, in order to prove this such a theorem, we need to know a little bit about what happens in the infinite distance. So we assume that the uh, four-point correlation function of a light operator whose conformal dimension become light is going to be well-defined in the limit, doesn't diverge or anything. Yeah, tell him. So you, we'll just, we can discuss that when I get to its derivation, so then you can see where uh, there is a possibility of opio. It can also have a boundary in target space, for example, but we, we can discuss that after we, I present it, okay? Any other question? Yes? Do you have any result in the converse direction? Do you just assume you have a two-way That's my another future aspiration. Thank you. That, I'll come to that in, the, in my last slide. Any other question? Yes? No, I'm going to prove this for any unitary conformal field theory in two dimensions with discrete spectrum. Okay, any other question before I get started? Okay, so let me get started. Okay, so this is the plan of my talk. So I'll first discuss example because examples are useful and I prove the first two theorem and I prove the third last theorem and I'll discuss the future direction. Okay, so that's my plan. Okay, so examples. The first example is a sigma model with target space tori. This is a very simple example, so this is the easy one. So uh, the moduli space are parameterized by two complex parameters, Kera moduli and the complex moduli, and you have this uh, Zamorozhikov metric. So there are various interesting points. For example, you can have over for the point where you have some enhanced AC3 symmetries, and this is at finite distance. It's a singularity of moduli space, but it's a finite distance. And if so there is a finite gap that doesn't decay. Now, uh, the large volume limit is at infinite distance, and in fact, the gap decays exponentially. And this is actually one of the motivations of my original work with Cameron. And in that case, alpha hits the upper bound. Okay, so this is an easy example. The second example is more interesting. So let's consider uh, the n equal to two uh, super conformal sigma model with target space as quintic Harabia manifold. So this model has a variety of uh, uh, singularities. There is a, a Z5 of for the fixed point, which is actually a Gepner point. So you have super conformal minimum model, tensor the five times and the OB4 dies. And this has a gap. And this is actually a finite distance. And this is a gap. And we know what kind of field saturate this bound. This is a non-PPS primary operator with zero uh, R charge. So, so this is the OB4 theory. There is a conifold, the conifold is a very interesting point, and it's again a finite distance singularity in the moduli space. And it's more, in, it's also interesting because there is a continuum coming down at the conifold point, but the continuum stops at one half, doesn't go all the way to zero. And this continuum is described by this uh, uh, SL2R uh, Kazama Suzuki type model. And uh, so, so this is that finite distance example. And then there is an infinite distance point. Uh, and uh, if you are careful in uh, uh, normalizing the homological metric, you find that there is actually six in, the, in, 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 in front compared to one over here. So this one actually translates into alpha equal one. So since there, this is normalized with six, so alpha in this case is one over square root of six, which is less than one. So this is interesting. And I'm going to explain why this, is, this does not saturate the bound. This has to do with uh, Ma the existence of marginal operator in near the uh, near this infinite distance point, which are not exactly marginal. Okay, so these are examples. Okay, there is actually non-unitary CFT, which also exhibit interesting things. So this is a tri trivial example of non-unitary CFT. Let's just consider the, the same sigma model, this quintic sigma model, but just tensor it with the non-linear, uh, the you non-unitary know, theory with c equal minus 21 over 4. So this theory has, is non-unitary, and in fact, uh, there is a uh, operator of conformal dimension minus one half, okay? But this has a normalizable vacuum. 
normalized over operator one. So in this case, the conformal manifold of the theory is the same as the conformal manifold of this quintic sigma model. And uh, this point contains a point where a conformal dimension vanishes because this has, a this has a continuum, as I said, goes all the way to one half at the conifold point. And this has a conformal operator of conformal dimension minus one half. So if you combine them, you get the gap which vanishes there, but it's a finite distance. So you say that, well, this is a counterexample to our theorem. But this is counterexample because this is the non-unitary theory. So you see that in order to prove this theorem, we have to use unitarity, okay? So, so these are the three examples that I wanted to mention. Xiao Han. I prove, I, I interpret my theorem as written. Okay, so now I'd like to present the proof of these two statements. I'd like to remind you of uh, these proofs and the theorems. So namely the first statement I would like to show is that it takes an infinite distance to reach the limit on conformal manifold where the lowest positive conformal dimension vanishes. And the second dimension, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the statement is that it, 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 it decays exponentially. That uh, uh, the, the conformal gap decays exponentially uh, with the uni universal upper bound of alpha bounded above by one. We also uh, identify the necessary and sufficient condition when this bound is saturated, okay? Okay, so let me first prove this theorem when there is only one exactly marginal operator and when this is exact, okay? So this, uh, uh, when, when it, is, it is exact. So that in this case, conformal manifold is one dimensional. In this case, actually, we show that uh, the alpha saturates a bound at alpha equal one. Okay, so, so, so let me prove it in the following way. So, so suppose there is a primary field O whose conformal dimension vanishes at some point on the conformal manifold. So this is an assumption of the theorem. We want to prove that distance to that point is infinite. So choose a geodetic coordinate so that uh, this conformal dim dimension delta of T monotonically decreases towards that point. Then there is a renormalization group equation, which basically says that the, deri uh, the, the, the derivative of this conformal dimension along this uh, geodesic is given by three-point function of this operator with the exactly marginal operator M. So this is this M, okay? And uh, the question is whether the, the distance T diverges. But if you look at this equation, you can easily say that T can diverge towards that point where delta vanishes if and only if, only if, excuse me, only if this three-point function vanishes at least linearly in delta. So now I'm going to show you a stronger statement that says that uh, this actually vanishes linearly but with coefficient one. So this means that by integrating this equation, this delta gap goes to exponential of minus t, therefore alpha equal one. Okay, so this is what I'm going to prove. Okay, so next two slides are the proof of this statement. Okay, so let me start with the following simple observation. We have this global SL to our symmetry, the conformal symmetry, so which we can use to show that if I take derivative of this operator whose conformal dimension becomes smooth, small, if I take derivative, there must be an operator J of this dimension multiplied by square root of delta. This follows from this uh, conformal algebra. So therefore, you can prove that, you can show that three-point function of j, j bar m is equal to uh, 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 the three-point function of this, by this relation with the extra delta in front. So therefore, what we wanted to show was that this three-point function goes like delta with coefficient one, which is equivalent to say that the three-point function of j, j bar m goes to one in the limit. This is what I want to show, okay? So to show that, I'm gonna use conformal bootstrap, in particular crossing symmetry of the four-point function of this operator O, which becomes light in the limit. So I'm gonna expand this four-point amplitude in terms of global conformal blocks. And global conformal blocks are nice because uh, it's expressed in terms of our familiar friend, the hypergeometric function, okay? And I was extremely happy when I remembered that F21 of 1, 1, 2 is equal to minus one over zeta times log of one minus zeta. Because uh, if we use this fact, then 
we can actually write this uh, crossing symmetry equation in this way. That because of this simple form, the crossing symmetry equation becomes of this form. And uh, you, on the left-hand side, you have absolute value of cjj bar square minus 1 divided by this function. And on the right-hand side is a function which is actually linearly independent of this function. So from this, it immediately follows that to the order of delta, this three-point function has to be equal to 1. So therefore, you, you can show that this three-point function of OM goes like delta, and therefore, this follows. So this is a, a proof of uh, this statement. OK, so now, suppose there are several, you have a question. This is an infinite sum, but I can show that continuum does not contribute from theorem three, which is, can be proven independently. The, the right hand side is an in, in, uh, uh, infinite sum, but the, the, all these, these functions are linearly independent of this, because all the hypergeometry functions are linearly, all the com global conformal blocks are linearly independent in this case. Yes. It's become global chroma in the, in the limit, yes. But you can think of this as a functional form, functional, functional equation. Once you write the, this equation, then, then we can forget about all these quantum field theory statements. I'm just talking about functional analysis at this point. Yes? I have no idea how pr we prove it in higher dimension. But uh, I think uh, the, the original proof of Baum and Calderon Infante has similar flavor to this. But they didn't use crossing equation. I think that one might consider doing this. So we are actually trying to do something like that, strengthening their result, and we might be able to determine, put constraint on alpha, but that's a work in progress. In high dimension, it's much more complicated because we have to worry about spins. Okay, any other question? Okay, so so far I have considered the case with when you have only one marginal operator and when it is exact. But in general, the conformal field theory can contain several marginal operators, and some of them may not be exactly marginal. In that case, by just a trivial extension of what I, I just did, we can show that uh, this contraction of this three-point function with the homological metric goes to one in that limit. But some of these indices here, mi, may go in the direction of not exactly marginal operator. So let's choose the direction where it is exactly marginal as ma. And let's take the limit of three-point function as alpha a. So then you can show that uh, the, the norm of this vector alpha is less than or equal to one. And it is equal to one if and only if the three-point function to the marginal but not exactly marginal operator vanishes. Okay? And then, then, then gap decays exponentially like that. So if you choose a direction of, uh, uh, so that it goes in the direction of steepest descent, then, 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 then the, it decays, it decays like, a, uh, uh, so, so, so you can always write it in this way. And alpha is bounded by one. And alpha hit one, the upper bound, under the two conditions. First condition is that the three point function to marginal but not exactly marginal operator vanishes. And the second is that you choose the direction of steepest descent. And if you choose these two conditions, then we can, you can have alpha hitting the, the upper bound, okay? And otherwise, it's less than one. So that's the result of theorem two. So this is a, this is a proof of theorem one and two. Any question? Yes? Yeah, but we have, we have infinite, uh, linear, uh, infinite sum of uh, uh, hypergeometric functions. And I think hypergeometric function has a standard uh, 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 linear independence properties. Well, so, so I'm, I'm talking about linear independence of this type of function. So I'm saying that we cannot write this type of function in terms that can appear over here. That's my statement. 
You're asking, you're, you're asking me to clarify why this is the case? Okay, okay. Well, we can discuss that, but, uh, but I think that uh, uh, we, 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 can, we can talk about the terms that appear over here. Okay, any other question? O and J are related by this equation. Is it, is it okay? We could do that too. That, that it is just a simplified notation because then you have to write J is equal to one, uh, uh, one over square root of uh, one, one over I times square root of delta times delta of phi, and so 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 so. This is just to, to, to simplify it. I wrote it as J. Any other question? Okay. So now I, I go on to the derivation of the, uh, uh, the third theorem, which says that. Uh, CFT in this infinite distance limit is a direct product of sigma model at large radius and compact conformal field theory. And from this, it follows that alpha is now bounded below by one over square root of C, okay? So, in general, there are actually large number of primary fields. In fact, we will see that there are infinitely many primary fields whose conformal weight vanishes toward the infinite distance limit. And for each one of them, you can define this J. J's are linearly uh, independent operators for finite distance, but they may become degenerate. They may become linearly dependent in the limit. So it'd be interesting to understand the relation. And we can actually find the relation between these operators by using operator product expansion of these right operators. So if you consider operator product expansion uh, like that, we can, we can write it in this way where there are uh, operator product expansion into right operator, and there are operators uh, that we can also have contribution of. Uh, so in general, the spectrum can have the following structure that uh, you can have uh, operator whose conformal dimension becomes small and hits the ground, uh, hits the vacuum conformal dimension. But there might also be some operators whose conformal dimension remains finite in the limit. So we can introduce some kind of uh, parameter delta finite, which is sort of gap to this uh, operator with finite dimension, who remains finite dimension, and all other operator goes to zero dimension, okay? So, so then, then you see that there you can actually separate this contribution of these two operators in the limit because all the operator whose conformal dimension is greater than delta finite can be bounded in this way. So we can consider operator product to expansion within the right operators, and if you have this, then if you, for example, uh, consider acting this derivative operator uh, and then using this relation and then take the limit when delta goes to zero, you get a linear relation among j's. And uh, if you also take a derivative, product of derivative acting on both sides and use this, you can find a quadratic relation between them. Since there is a linear relation between them, you can try consider finding the orthogonal uh, basis for this linear operator, and let's call that as J mu, thank you. And then, since you have quadratic relation, the only consistent form of this quadratic relation is like that. Now, if you assume unitarity of conformal field theory, and if you normalize J to be like Kronecker delta, then you have to cons conclude that by consistency of the algebra, uh, F, uh, this is F uh, mu nu rho has to be the structure con constant of either zero, if f is either zero or the structure constant of compact semi-simple B algebra. But you, you, you can show that if, you, if it is actually a, a, a structure constant of compact semi-simple Lie algebra, it contradicts with the assumption that the spectrum goes to zero because uh, their charges are quantized. So therefore, the vanishing of a spectral gap in the limit requires that f vanishes in the limit. So therefore, we can show that uh, in the limit, you have this algebra of free operators. In fact, you can bosonize them, and since the, the derivative of O is like exponential of J, you can show that O is the, the vertex operator. And you can show that P mu becomes continuous in the limit of T goes to infinity. So this shows that the conformal field theory in the limit is a product of sigma model with target space decompactified to Rn. 
times compact CFT. Now, since uh, uh, the tot assuming that total conformal dimension is C, then since compact CFT parts should also have non-negative conformal dimension, so N has to be bounded by C. Now, you can show that uh, that uh, if you the alpha uh, the CFT decompact phi to n uh, r n, the alpha becomes actually one over square root of n. So from that we can see that alpha is bounded below by one over square root of c. So this is what uh, 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 we showed that the delta can vanish only in finite distance limit in the conformal manifold, and where the gap decays exponentially like that and this, this is bounded by in this way. Now, in the case of superconformal super symmetry, we can strengthen this a little bit, because now this she is uh, uh, replaced by she hat. You can show that she is replaced by she hat. And this explains why Quintic had alpha equals C equals one over six, because the she hat is six in the Quintic case, and so this Quintic case hits a lower bound. Now, it's interesting to interpret this in the language of ADS, uh, uh, theory, what, that, what it means in this. So we need to translate this alpha into ADS parameter. And so, so I was just talking to Juan before the, uh, the, before the talk, and so we had some discussion of the scaling. But I, I believe that uh, this translates into the following statement, that uh, so, T, so, so T here uh, is this a conformal, is a conformal manifold coordinate, so it's dimensionless. But in ADS, the corresponding scalar field has a dimension of square root of mass. So that means that alpha has to have a dimension of square root of length. So, so in ADS, so therefore the bound translate into ADS radius. Oh, it's the other way around. Frank radius and ADS radius, but uh, I'm just writing this on the board, and I'm going to quickly erase it because I need to uh, check this carefully after the talk. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, so thank you for uh, uh, indulging me with this speculation. Uh, so, so the future program. So there are many things I want to do. Uh, I guess one of you, maybe Jake, asked me about converse, and converse is very important that the spectrum gap always vanishes in if in this just limit. And uh, so this is something I would like to investigate. And I have, we have some idea about how to do that. Deriving such a bound for higher in higher dimensions is also very interesting. I think we are, what we are trying to do is to use similar kind of crossing symmetry in higher dimensions. But, but, but the, technically it's much more difficult because you have to disentangle various issues with spins. Now, uh, this uh, distance conjecture and in particular property of this modular space of conformal manifold, it's very closely related to the splitability of minus one form symmetry because basically what we are doing is gauging the minus one form global symmetry uh, on the manifold. And uh, so therefore, in that sense, it's actually related to the weak gravity conjecture. And so the relation to weak gravity conjecture is interesting. Of course, eventually we want to extend it to flat space and uh, digital space or some accelerating universe. And uh, so flat space, maybe there is a tool because we can consider SMS3 bootstrap or some soft theorem for scalar moduli that uh, potentially can be used to derive similar theorems. Anyway, so what I aim at doing to uh, uh, give a sharp boundary between the swamp plant and the landscape, and I, would, I hope that we can sharpen this further. Thank you. Thank you, Hiroshi. Questions? Yeah, sure. Does it follow from what you said that the volume of the conformal manifold is finite? Good question. I do not know why you think so. Yeah, so we did, uh, we did conjecture that uh, in my paper with Cameron, if I remember it correctly. But uh, I, I think, you know that, uh, so, yeah, so, so if, we if we understand how this, yeah, I, I think we probably, yeah, 
You might be right. You might be right because we know from theorem three that uh, uh, we know exactly how the infinite disk we can approach infinite. So this we, the theorem three says that this is the only way we can approach the infinite distance, and then, then there the, the the volume doesn't diverge. Indeed, you are quite right. So so I suspect I need to think, but I suspect you are quite right that we can also prove that the volume is finite. Thank you. Ah, no, 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 actually, not quite. Because what we proved is that if the delta vanishes, then the distance to that point is infinite. But we didn't say that all the infinite distance points are like that. I think in order to prove what you said, I think we need to show that all distance, infinite distance points are like that. Do you agree? Yes. So, so therefore, if we can prove this converse, then it follows that uh, that uh, 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 the, the volume is finite. Do you agree? Yes. Thank you. Um, we, we know lots of interesting uh, examples where the gap in the conformal dimension doesn't go to zero, but the twist gap, uh, like, a, like a small string tension, uh, mm -hmm. goes to zero. Do you think your ideas can be adapted to tell us anything about uh, that sort of situation? A good, good, very interesting question. I haven't thought about it, but uh, uh, at least in conifold case, the, the continuous spectrum to finite gap doesn't give you this kind of singularity. So I don't know. I need to think about this. Thank you. Juan well, had some question. So in the example where you, you were finding alpha equals one over square root of six, can there be towers that are lighter than this? No. Oh, OK. Uh, at near Conifold, I know exactly the spectrum. There's a vacuum. My question might be related to the previous one, but let me ask it again. So in the bulk. Uh, we, this, these limits where things become light are either the compactification limits or, or limits where the string tension becomes small, right? But right. They, they, they don't seem to correspond to theories that on the boundary are free. So this would be... Yes, uh, so, so this is a very interesting point. So, so there seems to be a quite a contrast between higher dimensional case and the two-dimensional CFT that we discussed here. Uh, so there is actually a very beautiful work by Wolfgang Lerche, who might be here, and uh, Timo Weingrand and Lee, that they looked at the uh, variety of Caravial compactification and conjecture that all infinite distance points are either decompactification or the uh, tensionless string limit. In higher dimension, the all cases, at least the case that Caldero, Infande, and Baum looked at, uh, have, seems to have tension on the stream, if I understand it correctly. Uh, but this seems to be very different. And so it seems like there's a quite a difference between higher dimensional case and the two-dimensional case in that regard. Well. There are no more questions, then let's thank uh, Hiroshi again.